Hello. We have uh, studied many methods for uh, solution of swing equation. See, when you're talking of the stability of a power system, uh, understand that I cannot apply my normal linear control theory. The reason being that the system equations are nonlinear, right? The swing equation is nonlinear. So the only way to solve nonlinear equations when I don't have a direct uh, closed form solution, I have to resort to numerical methods. I have to resort to numerical methods. So the popular numerical methods we saw in my uh, one of my sessions used for swing equation is modified Euler's, Runge Kuta method, step by step uh, method, and uh, predicted prediction correction uh, algorithm, Milne's uh, prediction correction algorithm, and so on. Right? So, in this session, I will uh, show you how to solve the swing equation with a numerical example for Euler's method, modified Euler's method. Now, whenever we use numerical methods, uh, there are some things you have to be uh, aware of. The first thing is you should know your initial condition. Clear? My initial condition should be known to me. So before a fault occurs, after all this, the concept of a swing equation solution arises because my network has changed right because the network has changed maybe due to a fault so i should see how this fault affects the swing of the generator and uh, you know that predominantly the swing is dependent on the accelerating power clear so i need to know the initial point this is very important then i need to know when the fault occurs and when the fault is cleared. As far as the system is concerned, the occurrence of a fault and clearing of a fault, both are disturbances. Both are disturbances. So essentially, you should know when a disturbance occurs in the system. This is the, um, this is the second part. So this is all about the system. Now, when it comes to the numerical method, the most important aspect is the step size. So what step size do I use? What step size do I use? This is very important. Okay. So now we will see in this session how we solve using Euler's method. I have already told, but we will first go through the method and then see the specific solution of the swing equation. So I am Professor Umar Rao, uh, Professor in Electrical Engineering at RB College of Engineering. So we saw that all these faults are large. So what constitutes a large fault, a loss of load, a sudden loss of load, loss of generation, chunk generation is lost, one generator, 500 megawatts generator goes out of step, short circuits, unbalanced faults, single line to ground, double line, so on, double line to ground. So why do I need this analysis first of all? I need it for planning and design. I need to know how the faults will affect the system, whether any particular fault would drive my system to instability, then I can be prepared for it. So we need it for offline planning and design. And online, while the system is in operation, I need this for load management. So I have presented some case studies on blackout. Okay, so do I need to shed a load to protect a blackout? 
So how do I manage the load? Do I need to increase it? You can't increase the load, you can only decrease it. So if the load is less, you have to only shed the generation. Do I take, have to take some kind of an emergency control measure? Like say shedding of load or islanding. That means separating a part of the grid from the rest of the system and so on. These are all emergency control measures. And then I have to make a stability assessment. Do I have enough of security in the system? Do I have enough of security in the system? Can my system uh, ride through a fault? So these are all some critical issues because of which we do it, right? And as I told you, I can't apply the linear control uh, uh, theory. And you have in, in your swing equations, you have differential equations for the swing of the machine. That is nothing but the swing equation. And you have algebraic equations because when you solve the differential equation, you will be solving for delta. And with change in delta, the power flows also will change. So your algebraic equations are nothing but your load flow equations here. So I have to take into account that. Now, when we do uh, transient stability studies, we need to consider three networks. First, I have a steady state pre-fault network. That means before the fault occurs, the system is in equilibrium and is in steady state. So what is that network? I need to do a load flow for that. What are the voltages, etc.? So that's called as the pre fault network. Then the fault occurs, right? It may be a short circuit, it may be a single line to ground fault. The network is obviously different here. Yeah. So that is called as the network during the fault. So I have to continue the simulation during the fault. Of, of, of course, if the fault it remains, it's called as a sustained fault. Most cases, sustained faults, uh, if they're uh, large, will drive the system to instability. Clear? Then I clear the fault. I have the post fault network. So the fault can be cleared maybe by opening a line or just naturally the fault may be cleared. If a lightning strikes, it may clear by itself after some time. So that is a post fault network. So what do we have? We have the pre fault network, the network during a fault and a post fault network. Now, the time taken to clear the fault is called as the clearing time. The time taken to clear the fault is called as the clearing time. So the longer the fault, more chances of your system becoming unstable. If the fault lasts for a longer time, we have more chances that the system will go into instability. Clear? So clearing time is the time taken to clear the fault. So this will include the moment from the fault initiation till the fault clearance. So that will take into account the relay operating time, the breaker operating time, and so on. Now, as I told you, if the fa fault lasts for a longer time, there is more chance that the system will become unstable. And there is one time Okay, you cannot let the fault persist beyond that. You cannot let the fault persist beyond that. That means if you do not clear the fault before that specific time, the system will become unstable. That time is called as the critical clearing time. The time is called as the critical clearing time. So what's the critical clearing time? the maximum time available to clear the fault. Some people mistakenly, they say it's the minimum time. It's not the minimum time, it's the maximum time. So that is the maximum time you have to clear the fault. You must 
clear the fault before that time else the system will become unstable clear so that is the critical clearing time now the critical clearing time is not a unique number for a given system i can't say in this system the critical clearing time is 200 milliseconds i can't do that right or i, I can't say the critical clearing time is 25 cycles why yes i had told you that the swing there is acceleration which the network undergoes during a fault will depend on what type of fault it is because the nature of the fault will determine the electrical power output and we assume during transient stability studies that the mechanical input doesn't change so your accelerating power essentially depends on the type of fault or type of fault the location of fault and how much of time the fault exists that is the duration of the fault so critical clearing time cannot be specified for a given network you can only specify for a type of fault at a particular location so you can say the critical clearing time for the system for a three phase short circuit at bus number 5 is 250 milliseconds clear and likewise you can say the critical clearing time for a three phase fault at bus number 10 is 100 milliseconds so you can quote like that so now for the system when i i told you we use it for planning so how do i plan or design i design the system to withstand the worst fault so you 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 see different faults okay and what is the critical clearing time for each of them and you you take which is the worst case that means the shortest time please remember larger the critical clearing time it is better for you because you have a longer time to clear the fault so if i ask you i have two systems and one has a critical clearing time of 20 cycles and another has 50 cycles obviously 50 cycles is better it is robust the fault clearing time is high okay so i take the worst case means i take the case which will gives me the shortest critical clearing time so what type of fault at which location gives me the smallest critical clearing time that is the worst fault for the system and you have to plan for that fault right so we do something called as contingency analysis where for a given state of the network for a given state of the network we simulate the network for different kinds of faults and then we rank them one two three four so number one is the most critical so that's the one which will have the smallest critical clearing time and as the rank increases the clearing time becomes larger that means those faults with a larger critical clearing time are not serious so the critical faults are the ones which have a very short ccp critical clearing time so you have to build your uh, design your network to withstand that and to be robust under that and when you're planning a control you have to plan what is the next step i would take if it occurs so in contingency analysis we plan right right now no fault has occurred but then if faults occur what is the most severe fault and how will i take care of it what control action i have to take so the operators will be prepared for it and if the fault occurs immediately they can execute the control which they have decided on okay so that's why it is very important and now i told you there are some online applications also like load management emergency control etc so in when i when i use something for online control my algorithm must be fast right it must be quick computation time is very important and numerical methods will take a lot of time so in that way euler's method is simple modified euler's method is simple 
and uh, we will see now how we can solve it numerically. So I think this we have already seen anyway for a recap. Uh, when we do a swing equation solution, there are some assumptions we make. Firstly, resistances are neglected. Okay. And this will give you a pessimistic result. That means your result is better than what you get. Pessimistic means, you know, when you, you look at the bad side of things. Okay. So if I neglect resistance, resistance gives damping to the system oscillations. So if I neglect resistance, I get pessimistic results. That means my result is actually better than it better than what I get. So always remember in stability studies, pessimistic results are, uh, results are okay because you will, you will be taking precautions. But if you get optimistic, that means you think a system is stable when actually it is unstable. That is optimistic. That is dangerous because you will not be taking a suitable control action. You will not be taking a suitable control action. Is it clear? So neglecting resistance is fine. And we neglect damper windings in the synchronous machines. This again gives pessimistic results because damper windings, as the name indicates, are there to damp the oscillations. Okay. If I neglect it, then definitely my results are pessimistic. What does that mean? My system is better than what I am actually seeing. Variations in rotor speed are neglected. So I'm not going to take into account uh, the speed variations. We assume the mechanical input to be a constant. The reason being I want only a short time frame for the stability. And the mechanical input control is with the turbines. So they cannot instantaneously change their input. So if you, if you think of a hydro turbine, you cannot suddenly, you know, the gate positions, they won't jump up. So it, it has a higher time constant to act. So we assume that for the duration of interest, the mechanical input is a constant. Then all my generators, they're modeled as a constant voltage source behind a transient reactance. What does this mean? The subtransient reactance is too small. The subtransient period is too small for a fault to be cleared. So generally, it, and it lasts for a very short time. So I am interested in the transient stability. So I'll be interested in the transient reactance, that is XD prime. So you know, in an alternator, the subtransient reactance is the lowest, right? So you will have a very high fault current initially for a very short duration. Next, we have the transient reactants, and then the steady state reactants is the highest. So in all transient stability studies, we will be considering the transient reactants. So the generator is modeled as a simple voltage source in series with the transient reactants. And for simplicity, the loads are modeled as constant admittances. Okay, the P and Q is converted into the corresponding R and X based on the initial voltages. So once, what is the advantage of this? If I consider it as a constant admittance, I can make it a part of the admittance matrix. I can make it a part of the bus admittance matrix. Clear? So these are all some of the uh, modeling aspects uh, of uh, solving swing equations. Now, modified Euler's method we had seen earlier. Now, just for a recap. So, if I have two differential equations in x and y, right? So, I have dx by dt. It's a function of x, y, and t. And dy and by dt, I have as a function of x, y, and t. So I know the initial values. I know x0 and y0 at time t0. t0 is the starting time. I need to know it. So you know in any differential equation, the initial conditions are a must. You need to know it. So the initial conditions I know. Right? So I have dx. 
I calculate dx. That is the differential of x. dx by dt. I calculate dx by dt at values, initial values of x0, y0, and t0. Okay. Similarly, I calculate dy, dy as a function of x0, y0, and t0. Here, we do this. Now, in, in Euler's method, this itself is taken as the, uh, is taken to find the next, the, at the next iteration, what are the values of x and y. That means how x0 and y0 proceeds with time. In modified Euler's, we find an intermediate value, which we call as the predicted value. Clear? So, what does this give me? This is uh, xp. xp is equal to x0 plus dx into h. So, dx, remember, is dx by dt. And h is the time step, which is delta t. So, that gives me dx into h gives me the small variation in the variable x. So this intermediate value is called as the predicted value, right? So I make a intermediate prediction for xp and yp, okay? And I calculate again the differentials for xp using xp, yp, and t1. t1 is what? t0 plus delta t. That means the time in the next iteration the time in the next iteration, that is t1. So I, I recalculate dx and dy, that is the differentials, dx by dt and dy by dt with the predicted values, with the predicted values. So I calculate dxp and dyp. Then I update my values of x1 and y1. That is x1 is the value of x at the new time that is next time step next time step so that is x naught old value plus the average of the two differentials into h h is nothing but delta t the time step clear so as i told you in solution of this differential equation what is crucial you this fx fy they're all determined by the system you can't make your own function that is a mathematical model of the system so the only thing which is variable here is h. So that is your time step. If you take too small a time step, then the number of computations will be very large. Right? For example, if you want to simulate for one second and you take a time step of one millisecond, right? So you'll have thousand computations for one second. So if you want to simulate the system for five seconds, 5,000 iterations so large computer computing time if you take it too large then you'll be jumping so you might miss the dynamics in between after all it's a non-linear system right so you can't take very large iterative steps because then the non-linearity may not be captured so we should take a correct value of h that is very important neither too small nor too large. So this is general equation. So swing equation we have already seen is uh, md square delta by dt square. So one variable x will be delta and the other variable y will be omega. So d delta by dt corresponds to, if you want to relate to my uh, previous discussion, it is dx by dt that is equal to omega. And d omega by dt is equal to d squared delta by dt squared is equal to pa by m. We have seen this in many problems also. And the accelerating power is the mechanical power pm minus the electrical power. And the electrical power is given by p max sine delta by m. Clear? Now, what all will change here? So I start with an initial value of delta naught and omega naught. Here, remember, omega is not the actual ang angular velocity. It's actually the change in the 
velocity. It is d delta by dt. So a constant delta will give rise to omega equal to zero because d delta by dt will be zero when delta is a constant. That does not mean your motor is not rotating. Clear? Yeah, that does not mean your motor is not rotating. It simply means your speed is a constant. Speed is a constant. Be careful here. Okay. So initially when I start my system is in steady state. So it will be running at a constant speed. So I will start with omega not equal to zero. When I start. And I will find out what is the value of delta for a particular power level. I'll show you with the problem. So then I start iterating using the uh, equations of modified Euler's method. So these are the two differential equations. So I start with omega naught and delta naught initially, and I calculate D1 and D2. So D1 is omega naught itself, and D2 is PM minus P max sine delta naught by M. So in this equation, M is a constant throughout. That's your angular momentum. It is GH by 180F if you are dealing with uh, degrees, or it is g h by pi f if you are going to use radians. So m is a constant. P max, what is P max? So when you draw the angle, the swing curve, okay, the maximum power is P max. So if you take a single machine in finite bus, the power is Ev sine delta by x. E is uh, the voltage, internal voltage. V is the terminal voltage. X is the reactance in between. So the maximum power will be EV by X. Or in general, any two buses, the maximum power will be V1, V2 by X. Now, X depends on the network. X depends on the network. So as you change the network, when do I change the network? I told you when a fault occurs, the network is changed. When a fault is cleared, the network will change. I may clear the fault by opening a line. So we have a pre-fault network, a post-fault network, and a network during the fault. Right? So if the post-fault network is same as pre-fault, when will it be same? Supposing I don't clear any line. I, of the fault is cleared without a line outage, then the pre-fault network and post-fault network will be the same. So I need to calculate Pmax for the pre-fault network, for the network during the fault, and for the post-fault network. Three values we have to calculate. Then we calculate the intermediate values of uh, delta P. I calculate the intermediate values of delta P. And I calculate d delta by dt with the intermediate values, right? And then I update delta and omega in the next iteration. Okay. This algorithm we know. Now we will take one actual value. I have a 50 hertz synchronous generator with an H of 5.2 megajoules per MBA and the Transient reactance is 0.3 per unit. And it's connected to an infinite bus through a double circuit line. Two lines are there, parallel lines. Double circuit means two, two parallel lines are there. So I have a transformer between the generator and the line. The transformer reactance is 0.2 per unit. And each line is 0.4 per unit. The generator EMF is 1.2 per unit induced voltage and the infinite bus voltage is 1 per unit and it is transmitting a power of 0.8 per unit. Got it? So a three-phase fault occurs at the middle of one of the transmission lines. It is cleared by isolating the faulted line. That line is removed. The faulted line is removed. Plot the swing curve using the modified Euler's method. If the fault is cleared in 6.25 cycles, so it's a 50 hertz system. So one cycle is 20 milliseconds, one by 50. The time period is 20 milliseconds. 
So 6.25 cycles. So 125 milliseconds. Clear? So what all do you have to do when you have a problem like this? First, determine the pre-fault, post-fault, during fault impedances. Pmax, Pmax 1, 2, 3, you need. Because when I solve the, solve the swing curve, right, I need Pmax. So I should use the relevant Pmax. Clear? That's the first thing. Then you need the initial value of delta. That's all. With this, you can solve. So we will see how we can do it. Okay, what's the data? So before the fault transfer, I have the generator, infinite bus. What are all the reactants between them? The generator transient reactants is 0.3. I have the transformer, right? I have, let me uh, just uh, take this. Yeah, this is the generator reactance. This is the transformer reactance. And this is the reactance of the double circuit line. So you know each line has 0.4 per unit. So two lines in parallel is 0.2. Therefore, x total x between the generator and the infinite bus is 0.7 per unit. Clear? And Pmax is V1, V2 by x. So the EMF of the generator is 1.2. The infinite bus voltage is 1 divided by 0.7. So that gives me 1.714 per unit, right? And initial power is 0.8 per unit. So initially, since it is in a steady state, my mechanical power also will be 0.8 per unit. And mechanical power will remain a constant at 0.8 per unit. But the electrical power will change. Electrical power is what? Pmax sine delta, right? So initially, so P max sine delta is equal to 0.8. So delta naught, the initial angle is sine inverse of 0.8 by 1.714. That is 27.82 degrees. That's equal to 0.485 radians. So this is the first thing you have to calculate depending on what data is given to you. Next, during the fault, what happens? A fault occurs at the midpoint of one of the lines. So this is the network. I have the generator, reactance is 0.3. I have the transformer, reactance is 0.2. I have one line, it is 0.4. And this is in the midpoint of another line. So it divides it into 0.2 and 0.2. Clear? So I need the transfer impedance. X is the transfer impedance between the generator bus and the infinite bus. So we will see how I can find it. So you see the in-between delta, I here, yeah, this delta, this delta, I convert into a star, equivalent star. So I get 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.05. So this is my network. Now, again, I have a star here. This is 0 0.6. 0.5 plus 0 0.1, 0 0.6, 0 0.05, and 0 0.1. So this star, again, I convert it into delta, right? And this is of interest to me. This is my transfer impedance. I am interested in this transfer impedance. So that is 1.9. So now I calculate the P max 2, that is during the fault, maximum power during the fault is 1.2 E into V by X, X during fault, it's 0.63, clear? So this is the maximum power during the fault. Next, I need to calculate maximum power post fault. Post fault, what happens? If there is no outage, my P max three will be equal to P max one because I have not removed the line. But in this particular problem, I have told you that the line, faulted line is removed. So what will happen to the reactants? 0.3, that's the generator reactants, transformer reactants, and one line is removed. I have only one line whose reactance is 0.4. So the maximum power is 1.333 per unit. Clear? Now I have everything to start. 
I have delta naught, omega naught, right? I have maximum one, two, three during fault, uh, pre fault, during fault, post fault. And I know the equations. Clear? So I'll just show you one illustration of how you solve Euler's equation. Let us assume that at the, uh, at the beginning of uh, a particular iteration, I have some value. Delta naught is 0 0.761. This is at the beginning of the iteration. So delta naught means the what I am starting with the iteration. Delta 1 is the next time step. So after that, what happens? Whatever was delta 1 will become delta naught. And then you will get at the next time step. So every time when you write the program, you will be resetting. Right. So delta naught is 0 0.761. And omega naught is 2.072. These are the values I have at the beginning of an iteration. This is only an illustration, right? I have put the val uh, put the expressions here again uh, for your uh, understanding. So PM is 0.8. Remember, PM will remain same. PM will remain same. I calculate M. M is GH, GH by uh, pi F in radians. So I get 0 0.0331 seconds square per radian. Now, this is, you know, after the fault is cleared, whatever I'm considering here. So P max after the fault is cleared was 1.333 per unit, right? So what, I, what am I showing you? I'm showing you at the beginning of an iteration, what is the value of delta I have? What is the value of omega I have? And what is the maximum power when in that period under consideration. So D1 is omega. So 2.072. D2 is PM minus P max sine delta. So this uh, uh, delta is 0 0.865 in between. And I have 0 0.0331. I get this. Then I fi find out delta P and omega P. And then I update. OK. I update. And uh, then I find out uh, again delta 1p, d2p, and then I, I update delta 1. Delta 1 is equal to delta naught, delta naught plus d1 plus d1p by 2 into step size. So here I have taken a step size of 0 0.05 seconds. 0 0.05 seconds, that is 50 milliseconds. Clear? So we get here, I think. Um, yeah, sorry, this should have been uh, 0 0.761, not 0 0.865. 0 0.865 is the answer. So this is 0 0.761 when I first do it. And I use this 0 0.865 in D2P. Clear? So this is how I update. That's all simple. Now let it, I have just put a table. So I start with T equal to 0. And I calculate D1, D2, D1P, D2P. I have just tabulated everything. Right. Now you just see here, I want to draw your attention here. I have zero minus, that means just before the fault, I am presuming that the fault occurs at t equal to zero. So zero minus means just before the fault. So the maximum power is 1.714. We saw that. I'll first uh, draw your attention to p max. Okay, then I have at 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15. So we had a fault clearing of 6.25, 6.25 cycles. Okay, so at 0.15 onwards, it becomes 1.33. So this here, the fault is cleared. Okay, this is only illustrative. The fault is cleared. Then you have initial value of delta naught. You start with omega naught equal to zero, right? So you see here with delta naught, omega naught, I update delta one and omega one. Okay, so this is in radians. I have put this in degrees. Now, what do I do in the next iteration? This delta one, omega one, this will become the delta naught and omega naught for the next step. Then again, I use the equations and I Calculate delta 1 and omega 1. Then this delta 1 and omega 1 will become delta naught and omega naught in the next time step. And so like this, we go on and off. So what do you have to pay attention to? Equations are the same. You only have to pay attention that you, you 
substitute the correct value of p max so when you are simulating during the fault in the equation p max will be 0.63 and post fault after the fault is cleared it will be 1.33 so you have to be careful about this and you proceed clear now by looking at this how can i say if the system is stable or not now just look at delta what's happening to delta delta i start with 28 degrees now a fault occurs so then it goes on increasing you see 32 37 43 goes up to 60 and then it comes down if the delta increases and comes down after some finite time then we say the system is stable it's able to recover from the fault clear but please see this decrease doesn't happen as soon as the fault is cleared no because once a fault is initiated you would have pumped in some kinetic energy you would have given some acceleration to the machine so the machine will accelerate up to some point and then it will start decelerating it will decelerate but still it will have a positive velocity so the speed will go on increasing delta will go on increasing and then it will come down clear so it goes on increasing and not uh, up to some time after the fault is cleared and then it starts decreasing clear so i can say this system is stable now how can i find the critical clearing time from this by just this i can't find so next what I do, I clear the fault in some 6.25 uh, cycles, right? Next, I, now I have found it to be stable. Next, I clear it at eight cycles. Again, I do all the solution. It is still stable. Then I clear it in uh, 10 cycles. Then it's stable. I clear it at 12 cycles. It becomes unstable. So for 10 cycle clearance, it is stable. 12 cycle clearance, it is unstable means I know that in between I have the critical clearing time. So then I can shorten the difference. So after 10, I can do 10.2, uh, 10.3 like that and get the approximate value of the critical clearing time. Right? So now you see here, I have simulated for one fault, a three-phase short circuit at the midpoint of the line. So you think of in a big system, how many types of faults you can have, number of faults, right? It can occur on the transmission line, it can occur at the buses, it can be a three-phase fault, it can be a single line to ground fault, everything. So you take all the critical faults, major faults, and then rank them, which is the worst, and plan your system for that, okay? So this uh, session was to... Uh, this session was to, uh, you know, uh, tell you about how to use the Euler's method for solution of the uh, swing equation.